This is indeed the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Fellow believers in Christ Jesus, Clark Kent, loser or leader? But if you ask Lois Lane, co-worker at the Daily Planet newspaper, she would say that Clark Kent, he's too timid, too much of a worrier for her taste. Superman, on the other hand, now that man of steel is the kind of warrior that she likes. Of course, you all know that Clark Kent is Superman. The loser is, in fact, a leader. The warrior, a warrior. Sunday, we're beginning a four-part sermon series on the Old Testament believer named Gideon, who lived just over 3,000 years ago. And we could ask the same question about him. Was he warrior or worrier? God himself would address Gideon as mighty warrior in today's text. And yet Gideon had a definite Clark Kent side to him. Timid. Worried. Well, today at Gideon's gig, we're going to find out how a loser becomes a leader and learn how God's presence in our lives takes us from being warriors to the faith filled, action loving warriors that God wants us to be. Now, during the time of Gideon, life was not easy for the Israelites. Their land was being overrun by a nomadic people called the Midianites. When the Midianites would show up, they would steal cattle from the Israelites. They would destroy their crops. There were so many of them that to the Israelites, it looked as if a horde of grasshoppers had descended upon them. This went on for seven years before the Israelites cried out for help. Why wait seven years to call for help? Well, why does it often take seven wrong turns before a guy will admit that he's lost and he needs to ask for directions? Pride. The people thought that they could fix this themselves, that maybe it really wasn't that bad. But when they finally turned to the Lord, he sent them a sermon rather than a savior. A prophet came to the people and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Why were the people being overrun by the Midianites? It's because they had run after the loser gods of the former tenants, the Amorites and the Canaanites. How was this working for them? They couldn't put up any kind of resistance against the Midianites. And so when they invaded, the Israelites ran for the hills and took refuge in dark, dank caves. How could they forget that God was their refuge? How could they for seven years put up with this kind of life and finding refuge in a place where most of us would not like to live? And yet we do this often too, don't we? Where we turn away from the God who is our refuge and we try to handle our problems on our own. But when God sent that sermon instead of the Savior or a Savior, you might have thought to yourself, that's typical of God. He's like, hey, I told you so, parents. God had to tell the Israelites what was fundamentally wrong so that they would be ready for what he was about to do on their behalf. He would send a Savior. First of all, he sent the angel of the Lord 
who went to the north part of Israel and Galilee, not too far away from Nazareth, where Jesus would grow up. And he plunked himself underneath an oak tree to watch an Israelite named Gideon at work. Gideon was threshing grain in a wine press. Do you know how inefficient that is? The whole process of threshing grain is you're trying to remove the husks, the hull from the kernels. And normally you would do this out in the open, preferably on a little hill, so that when you toss up the grain, the wind blows away the chaff. And the stuff that you want, the kernels fall to the ground, so you can go and take it and grind it into flour. Gideon was doing this in a wine press, and our Lego creator doesn't quite capture what that means. The wine press wasn't a little bowl. It was a pretty big contraption that you could stand in to crush the grapes. So here he is trying to thresh wheat in a big box where the wind and breeze really has no chance to sweep away the chaff. Why is Gideon doing this? Because he's a worrier. He's afraid that if he does this out in the open, there might be a Midianite scout who sees him and is going to come and take away his grain. And so what the angel of the Lord says next seems incongruous. He addresses Gideon like this, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Was that sarcasm, perhaps? The way that if Milo was watching me play basketball and I'm trying to do my best to get rebounds and block shots and he might come up to me and say, Pastor, nice ups. And he's thinking to himself, you're no NBA star. You're not the Ant-Man, Anthony Edwards, who plays for the Timberwolves. You're the Cant man I don't think that's what's going on here with the angel of the Lord. This is not sarcasm, but this was a predictive prophecy. God was naming Gideon what God would make him to be. Not unlike how when Jesus changed the name of one of his disciples from Simon to Peter, which means rock. How often did Peter fail to show a rock-like steadfastness in its following of Jesus? He failed again and again, and yet as Peter matured in the faith, as God continued to work in his heart, he would demonstrate this rock-like faith for which Peter is now known. God is going to do something similar to Gideon, but Gideon wasn't so sure. Gideon replied, but sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. Either Gideon did not hear the sermon God had preached to the Israelites, or he just did not believe it. Why is this happening if the Lord is with us? What's wrong with God? You see what Gideon is doing? Blaming God. The problem is not with us, God. The problem is with you. You find yourself doing the same thing. Lord, I'm really struggling with this marriage, and it's because, well, the person that I married is was just not the right one. And then we fail to acknowledge our own sinful selfishness, which is contributing to the problem. Or, Lord, my life is so boring, or it's so overwhelming. But of course, I have to find relief in the sinful pursuits, the lack of self-control that I exhibit, and the gifts that you have given to me. How would you have responded to Gideon's insolence? This is what God said. Go and rescue Israel from the Midianites. Have I not sent you? There was no rebuke. Just a divine commissioning. And still, Gideon, the warrior, dithered. 
But Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of Manasseh, and I am the least important in my family. You sound like someone else you know from Scripture? Moses, who upon being tasked with leading the Israelites out of Egypt, being tasked with confronting Pharaoh, said, I have never been eloquent, for I am slow and hesitant of speech. But as God would make known to Moses, and as he would say to Gideon, it's not about what you know. It's not about who you are. It's about who God is. And God continued to show patience with Gideon when he responded, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together, literally as one man. Oh, I love this exchange. Especially as your pastor. Knowing that I did not come here of my own accord, but through you, the Holy Spirit extended this divine call to me. That when things are difficult, when things are challenging, and I just would want to fade away, I can remember, no, Lord, you called me to this. And you will also equip me for the task. But this is also true of you, no matter what your vocation. You're feeling overwhelmed as a parent? you feeling outclassed at your workplace? Just unsure of the future? You're thinking, I don't know if I can really continue on. God says to you, I will be with you. And that's what matters. Not who you are, but who God is. And his steadfast relationship to you. Did this word of promise bolster Gideon? Did the worrier become a warrior, the loser a leader? Not exactly. But he took a baby step forward. When he said, give me a sign to prove that it is really you speaking to me. Do not leave until I return and present you an offering. Okay, Gideon has an idea that this individual that he's speaking to, this angel of the Lord, maybe he's the real deal. I, I need to figure this out. And so God responds, I shall stay here until you return. And so the Gideon goes off to the In-N-Out Burger, which actually that's not a good example because I heard someone waiting 30, 40 minutes to get their burgers this week. So you go to McDonald's because no one is going there anymore. And it takes you like 30 seconds to get a cheeseburger and a comeback. That's not what Gideon does. He butchers a goat. He prepares the meat. He boils soup. He needs enough dough so that he could bake 20 loaves of bread. This was not fast food. And yet through it all, God said, I will wait until you return. This is how incredible that is. Dads, if you're leaving for work, and your daughter runs up to you and says, Dad, wait, I want to make you a card before you go. What's your usual response? Oh, honey, that is wonderful. You know what? You work on that card, and I can't wait to see it when I come home. But I'm late for work right now. Door slams. Or are you the kind of father that says, you're going to make me a card? Wow. And you put down your briefcase, and you sit down as if you have all the time in the world. Is that not what God is doing for Gideon? As if he has all the time in the world to assure this worrier that indeed I am with you and you will become the warrior that I have called you to be. And here's the thing, the same angel of the Lord that appeared to Gideon is our God too. The God who's present everywhere at once. And the God who has tied himself to you with his promise of love and loyalty, he has all the time in the world for you. So what happened? When Gideon got everything ready, he brought it out to the angel of the Lord who said, well, put it on this rock. 
So Gideon placed the bread and the meat, and he poured out the soup. And the angel of the Lord stepped up to it and touched it with the tip of his staff. Fire comes shooting out of the rock. The offering is gone. But so is the angel of the Lord. He also disappears in a flash. Hot stuff, eh? Gideon didn't think so. Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Gideon realizes that indeed I have been speaking to God. And why is he so afraid? Why doesn't he run off to tell his friends and family of this encounter with the divine? This is a repeated refrain throughout Scripture, isn't it? When sinners come into contact with the Holy God and they realize that that is who they have been speaking to, they are terrified. Because they know this God sees everything that they have ever done and knows everything that is contained in that little brain of theirs. And as a holy God, he is not impressed. Think of the panic you would feel if that, that text that you wrote to one friend about another friend. It's not a flattering text at all, but you're griping and complaining and you're blaming, but instead you send it to the wrong friend. The person that you're complaining about. What's that going to do with your relationship and your friendship? Destroy it, perhaps forever? Gideon perhaps is feeling the same way. Oh, God sees me. But God was not done with Gideon. He said, be at peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Gideon was so impressed with these words of comfort that he built an altar right there and he gave it a name. The Lord is peace. Now we're getting somewhere. This loser is feeling more like a leader. This warrior is feeling like there's hope here. Maybe I am a warrior. Don't you wish you could have an encounter like this with the God that he would give you some sort of sign that everything is okay between you and him and everything's going to be okay in your life? Well, he has given you such a sign, hasn't he? In the person of Jesus, who on the cross endured suffering, ridicule, death, and hell, so that we, in turn, could receive joy and peace, heaven and life. I want you to picture that cross like a giant pen that God the Father picked up, and he signed this declaration of peace using the ink of his son's blood. You may wish that God would make a glittering, glorious appearance in your life. It would just terrify you. Here, God comes to us through Jesus. He says, be at peace. So what happened to Gideon? Did he really go from warrior to warrior? Well, you'll have to come back next week as we continue the series. And we learn about Gideon's gambit, about how he smashes the family altar. Was that an act of cowardice or an act of courage? Again, you'll have to come back to find out. But what have we learned here together this morning? We learned, first of all, that, that God hears when we cry to him for help. We don't need to wait seven years to do that. It should not be the thing that we do only after we've exhausted all other recourse, talked to our friends, racked our brains about what to do next, but you take it to the Lord in prayer. We've also learned that sometimes he needs to send us a sermon and point out that the reason for the challenges in our life may be our own sinfulness. But then haven't we also been reminded that he hasn't just sent a sermon, but he sent a Savior in the person of Jesus, the angel of the Lord, who with his death on the cross says, be at peace. 
the Savior of ours did not just die, but during this Easter season, we're rejoicing in His resurrection. He lives for you as well. And He comes to you as He came to Gideon. And He says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Whatever it is that God has given you to do this week, being a faithful parent, a faithful teacher, a student, a faithful grandparent, Do it knowing you don't do it alone, but with God's wisdom and His power. Be that warrior God has called you to be. Amen.